All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Justin. If you don't know me, I'm a, one of the pastors here. It's good to be with you. We are celebrating Labor Day tomorrow, and I've talked to a couple people today, and it seems like some of us are tired. Is anyone tired, worn down, weary, needing maybe some, um, maybe some Holy Spirit power in your life to kind of lift you up? Um, what I want to do today is in light of Labor Day, uh, I always try to do this on Labor Day if I, if I can, is talk about what it means to work. Uh, the dignity and the power, the purpose of work. And specifically, I want to look at how did Jesus labor? What can we learn from, from the life of Jesus? And how can we learn to labor like Jesus did? Okay? And so um, maybe you like me. Every Labor Day runs around, uh, comes around, and you're like, why do we celebrate Labor Day again? Anybody know? Why do we celebrate Labor Day? Let me just tell you, Wikipedia tells us, thank God, Labor Day is an annual celebration for the social and economic achievements of American workers. Okay? Holiday is rooted in the late 19th century when labor activists pushed for a federal holiday to recognize the many contributions workers have made to America's strength, prosperity, and well-being. Okay, so we're celebrating Labor Day to celebrate uh, the achievements, the American workforce, all that stuff. And so we take a day off from work to celebrate all the work that we've done. Okay, so I hope that you have um, freedom to take the day off tomorrow and just enjoy the fruit of your labor. Now, what I want to do, because in our culture, increasingly, uh, Christianity is, is shed in a, uh, uh, an unhelpful light, uh, maybe even a bad light. And so I, I've read this book a number of times to you. It's called How Christianity Changed the World. And I just want to read a couple things to you to give us an idea of how Christianity has made a positive impact on work and labor. Okay? I just think it's helpful to, to counterbalance uh, our culture. So let me just read a couple things. When Christ was born... The country of his birth was occupied by the Romans, who, like the Greeks, had an extremely low view of physical work. In their minds, manual labor was only suitable for slaves and the lower classes. It was demeaning for philosophers, theorists, and freemen. In fact, the Roman philosopher Cicero said this in the first century, working daily for a livelihood was, quote, unbecoming to a gentleman. In ancient Athens, there were five times as many slaves as citizens. And the freemen would sit around um, and just talk about daily events while slaves did all the, the manual labor. Okay, the ratio was not much better in the Roman culture where its non-slave population sought personal pleasure above everything else. That sounds a little familiar. Now, of course, when we look to the life of Jesus... He worked for the first 30 years of his life as a carpenter. He knows what it's like to do physical labor. He brought dignity to labor. The Son of God worked a normal job, a nine to five, probably more than that. Paul, of course, also had the trade of tent making. So alongside of his ministry, he saw the dignity of, of work. In fact, he says to the Thessalonians, in uh, first Thessalon uh, second Thessalonians 3.10, uh, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. And so he's challenging idleness Jesus, of course, quoting the Old Testament, say a labor is worthy of his wages and told a number of parables about the necessity and the dignity of work. And so, out of that culture, we get to the fourth century. St. Basil of Caesarea says this, idleness is a great evil. Work preserves us from evil thoughts. So they saw that work uh, was the Christian antidote to the sin of laziness, slothfulness. And finally, we get to the Reformation. Martin Luther had a huge impact on our modern day conception of work, he says this, he saw work not only as God pleasing, but also as a calling, a vocation to serve God. Luther's concept of work had revolutionary consequences. It meant there was no low status or high status work, good work or bad work. It made no difference what kind, uh, what kind of work the Christian did so as long as he performed it to the glory of God. This notion of work shifted the meaning from what and how to why. Work was not an end in itself, but something the person did ev in everyday life to the glory of God and to, ser and to the service of mankind. It was through work, especially the work of Christians, listen to this, that God maintained and preserved the world and the people in it. Thus, all legitimate work was noble and God-pleasing. Work was a Christian duty. 
And so we see this concept of Christian work uh, over and against the Roman and the Greek uh, culture, and even in the Reformation, giving us what many of us enjoy today, the work ethic, and really, in a lot of ways, what built up uh, our American culture, hard work, work ethic. And so we see that in our day. And so the question that I have for us today is if we call Jesus Lord and Savior, and we're called to become like him, that's what discipleship is, then what does it look like to labor like Jesus? What can we learn from the life of Jesus in our own laboring? And maybe you say, why would I even really care about that? I mean, I look at the life of Jesus and it didn't seem all that great, you know, from a worldly standpoint. So let me ask you a few other questions. Do you want joy in your life? Do you want purpose? Do you want passion in your life? If the answer is yes, then we must learn to labor like Jesus. Because when I look at the life of Jesus, I see a man who was full of joy. Doesn't mean he was happy all the time, but he had joy, he had purpose, and he had passion in his life. So if we become like him and we learn from him, we too will receive and experience those things. So what does Jesus have to teach us? So we're going to look at John 13 today. It's a pretty well-known passage where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And probably we may be too familiar with that passage. And so what I want to do is just slow down and ask some questions of the text and see what we might have to learn and what it means to labor like Jesus. Now, I'm cheating a little bit because next week we're going to start a series uh, from, on John 13 to 17. I'm just calling it Friendship with God. And we're going to be looking at the last teaching of Jesus as he sat with his disciples uh, hours before his arrest. What did he have to say to his disciples? What was he going to teach them and empower them to persevere when he left? And so today we're going to get a little bit of a preview into that by looking at John 13. Um, But it's also going to help us uh, answer this question. What does it mean to labor like Jesus? All right, let me pray for us and we'll get going. Father, thank you for sending Jesus as our substitute, as our example, as our Lord, as our Savior, as the one who walks with us every day. And I ask you today, today, Lord, to open up your word to our hearts that we might receive from you truth, grace, cleansing, washing, serving. You might make us more like you. We thank you for who you are. We give you this time. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and by your spirit, amen. Let's look at the first five five verses of John 13. Read this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. And he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So a few comments here. The first thing he says in verse 1 there, it's the feast of Passover. Jesus knew that his hour had come. Now in the Gospel of John, when he says the hour has come seven times, it always uh, refers to the crucifixion. So we know that this is the Last Supper that the foot washing happens in conjunction with the last supper or the first supper that Jesus did hours before he would be arrested, less than a day from him being tortured and executed. So Jesus' hour has come. Now, we got to remember that because of all that Jesus is about to say, right? And it says he loved his disciples. He loved them as they were in the world. He loved them to the very end. I mean, think about what Jesus is facing and he continues to minister and serve and teach to the very end. So maybe you're here and you think, where is Jesus? Is he loving me in this and through this? Whatever maybe is going on for you. I just get these little verses like this. It says, look, Jesus loved them to the very end. And Jesus promises in Matthew 28 that he will be with you to the end of the age. And so sometimes we need that truth. Even if you don't feel Jesus is here, He's here because his word says he is, okay? Now, the second thing we see is Judas is at the dinner. During supper, it says the devil had already put it into Judas Iscariot to betray him. Now, just think about this. 
We'll come back to this, but Judas is going to have his feet washed by Jesus. Very likely, he's going to partake in the Last Supper. That should astound us, that Jesus is willing to serve the very one who will betray him. And I read this verse, and, and, it, and it gives me pause, and it gives me some sobriety, because it says Satan put it into the heart of Judas. And I think we just need to know that we are in a spiritual war, okay? And the enemy has the power to influence our thoughts, okay? Every thought that you have may not be from yourself. It might be from God. It might be from yourself. It might be from the enemy. So we need to learn how to discern the voice of God. So we spent some time in the Psalms going, how do I hear the voice of God? How do I talk with God? And what we know, right, John 10, the enemy comes to do what? To steal he wants to steal your joy, to kill. He wants to kill your passion and to destroy. He wants to destroy your life. So I ask myself some very simple question when I'm hearing things. Is this something that Jesus would say to me? Very simple. And very often, if it's condemning, if it's accusatory, it's not the Lord. Now, the Lord will convict us, but there's a sweetness to it. There's an invitation to the cross. So when you're hearing something, there's only two directions you run. You either run to the cross or you run away from it. And if you're tempted to run away from it, it's probably the enemy because God will bring you to the cross. Jesus will bring you to the cross, okay? So it's just important to realize Jesus was in a spiritual war. I mean, he's casting out demons all over the place. We're in a spiritual war. We need to pay attention to what we hear. Thirdly here, Jesus says three things in verse three. He says, I know that the Father has given me all things. I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. Now we talk about well, how did Jesus labor the way that he did? It's because of these truths. It says, all that the Father, I know that the Father has given me all things. All that the Father has is Jesus's. He knows what he has. He knows who he is. Hebrews 12 says, for the, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross because he knew he had everything. Secondly, he knew where he came from. He knew he, as God, he came from God. That he came from God as God. The second person of the Trinity, G, uh, uh, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, existed for all time. And in the incarnation, he took on flesh. He became the man Jesus, fully God and fully human. He knew who he was. He knew where he came from. And thirdly, he knew where he was going. He was going back to the Father. He's going back to stand at the right hand of the Father in, the, in heaven, where he is now ruling and reigning. And we see this in Acts chapter 7. As Stephen is being stoned to death, he has a vision of Jesus standing in heaven at the right hand of the Father. That's where Jesus is. He's the sovereign king ruling and reigning right now. So these three truths are how Jesus labored the way that he did. And here's what we need to know. In Christ, these are true for us. Okay, in Christ, these are true for us. In Christ, number one, we have everything. Like I said, we have everything we need, which is true, but we have everything. Do you realize in the new heavens and the new earth, in Christ, he says everything that is his will be ours. And if that's true, and if we believe that, it changes the way we live. It means we can be willing to lose now because in the future, we will have everything. What a truth. In Christ, Romans 8, 16 says that we are co-heirs with God. Christ. Let that sink in. Co-heirs with Christ. Christ is reigning. We are reigning with him. We inherit with him. Number two, we know where Jesus came from. If you read, and we'll see this in John 13 to 17, time and time again, Jesus says this phrase, from the one who sent me. It's really important that we realize the one who sent Jesus was God the Father. And what he's saying is, I am God from God. God sent me. I am God in the flesh. And number three, we know where he went. Again, he is standing in heaven. And then Ephesians 2, 6, and 7 says this, that we were raised with him and, and seated us, God seated us with him in the heavenly places. So in some respect, we're sitting with Jesus right now. And so these three truths are for us. So if we're going to, to labor like Jesus, we need to believe and live these truths for us, okay? That we have everything in Christ. That he is God and that he is ruling and reigning right now as a sovereign king, okay? So, then what happens? These three things being true. Jesus as the king of the universe, the creator. He lays aside, he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now again, we may be familiar with this story, but let me just try to draw out this picture for you. We, because back in that day, 
So they didn't have nice sidewalks, nice streets, you know, trucks to come along and clean the streets for us. They had dusty roads. They had animals walking around, and so we had animal droppings everywhere. Furthermore, they walked around in sandals, almost everyone. So you would walk around, you'd get a bunch of gunk on your sandals and on your feet, and you'd go walk into someone's house, and if you didn't take off your sandals, and even if you did, you would track that stuff all over their house. And so there was a position of a slave to go and wash your feet when you came in. Now let me just try to help you connect with this. What in your life would you not want anyone to come in and do? So Jesus shows up at your door to come in and to clean your bathroom, to scrub your toilet, to remove all that hair from the drain that you don't want anyone to see, to clean out your fridge and all that moldy food that's been back that you've been meaning to get to for months, to come in to do your dirty laundry. Okay, this is embarrassing. This is what they would have felt. They would have said, what is Jesus doing? I mean, there would have been this awkward tension in the room. Why is, he, why is he doing that? I'm embarrassed. He can't see my feet. He can't clean my feet. I know what's on my feet. He can't do that. We've got to sit in the tension of what Jesus is doing. It would have been embarrassing, shameful even. Now I have a picture here. If you don't like feet, don't look at this picture. I have a picture of dirty feet, just so you can get a visual of what their feet might have looked like. Anybody want to scrub those feet? Jesus did. Jesus did. And so the washing of feet was so menial. It was such a menial task, reserved for slaves. Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish slaves were exempt from it, a job kept for Gentiles. All of our ancient sources, I'm quoting from a commentary here, show us that foot washing was a degrading and lowly task. When done by a wife or a husband, a child for his parents, or a pupil for his teacher, it was always an act of great devotion. But since it was an act with social implications, in no way do we find those with a higher status washing those of the feet of those below them. When Jesus takes off his outer clothing and wraps it around himself, he is adopting the posture of a slave the lowest form of existence. It is a staggering act of humility and service. And we need to feel this. So this is happening. They're all watching this happen, and it's awkward, and it's tense. Somebody's got to say something. Thank God for Peter, right? He opens his big mouth. And I imagine, the text doesn't say this, I imagine Jesus said, well, let's just go to Peter first and get this out of the way. I know he's going to say something dumb, but I love him. And we just need to understand what I'm doing. He comes to Peter, and Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Question mark? You ever do that? You ever talk to your text? You get so used to talking to your text that you're talking to someone. It's a comma, question. Anybody? Just me? Okay. Okay, thank you for joining me in that. Um, and Jesus says, listen, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Now think about this. In our life, things happen to us that we don't understand. And Jesus is doing something that they don't understand now. So I take that to mean, <laughs> to some extent, what's happening in your life right now that you don't understand? You say, why, Lord? Why is it like this? Why is it so hard? Why is this person suffering? Why did this person get cancer? Why did this person get divorced? And I hear Jesus saying, you do not understand right now why I'm letting this happen, but you will afterwards. And that's true. One day in the new heavens and new earth, we will understand everything. I do think if you're suffering now, if you have questions, you don't understand now what God is doing, but you will. Stick with him. Walk with him, as we'll see. And there's a whole context of John 14 to 16, abiding in Christ. Now listen to what Peter says to him. You shall never wash my feet. Now what you don't see in English is this is the strongest negation possible in the Greek language. It's the same as when uh, John 3, 16 it says that whoever believes in me shall not perish, never perish. It will not happen. It's the strongest negation. Peter's standing up. He's taking the stand. He's making the point. You shall not wash my feet. Jesus never. Now, maybe he thinks Jesus is testing him to see if he really thinks that highly of him. So, oh, no, Jesus can't, wa- can't serve me, can't wash my feet. No, Jesus is too precious for that. He says, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus, I just, look what he says, answers him. If I do not wash you, You have no share with me. You have no part with me. Now think about this. If 
we're going to labor like Jesus. We have to let Jesus serve you. You have to let Jesus wash you. That means you have to let Jesus into the dirt in your life. The sin in your life, the things that you're ashamed of and embarrassed in your life, the secret sins that nobody knows about. You have to let Jesus in to wash you. And it's embarrassing. It's humbling. It's shameful. It feels, Jesus, you can't do this. I'm too much, too much. If you don't let Jesus serve you and wash you, you have no part with him. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is not an easy thing to do. Jesus, the king of creation, humbles himself to serve you and to wash you, to wash your feet. And we have to humble ourselves to receive from him. It just feels backwards, doesn't it? It feels weird. But unless we let Jesus wash us, we have no part. Now the commentators say this is all referring to the crucifixion, that Jesus is going to die for our sins and by his blood he's gonna wash away our sins. And of course that's true. So in some ways, it's a metaphor of our salvation, that we, unless we come to Christ and we say, I need your forgiveness, I need your cleansing, we will not be united to him and we will not belong to him. We need the forgiveness of God. And sometimes the hardest thing to do is say, I need forgiveness for this. If we don't receive his forgiveness, if we don't let him serve us, we have no heart with him. Now maybe maybe you're out there maybe you say no not me. My sin is, is too egregious, it's too shameful you don't know what I've done. I cannot let go of that. I cannot receive cleansing. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the shame that I carry. I deserve this. Let me just remind you, Judas is sitting at the table. Judas is having his feet washed by Jesus. Judas, the enemy of Christ, who will betray him, is being served by Jesus. And I take that to mean that Jesus gave Judas an out, an invitation to the very end. And he didn't take it. But here's what's true for us. If you're here today, if you're hearing my voice, Jesus welcomes you. John 6, 37. In the King James Version, sorry, I do this every now and then. Listen, all that the Father giveth me shall, shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Listen to that promise. There is no sin too great. You cannot out sin God's grace. Jesus has come to me, and I will never cast you away. So hear me. Don't let anything keep you from coming to Jesus. Nothing. He gave it all. Don't let anything keep you from coming to Jesus. And if you're here right now, or you're listening online, you don't know Jesus, something's keeping you from him, hear this promise. He who comes to me, I will never cast out. And say right now in your heart of hearts, Jesus, I'm yours. Save me. Jesus, I'm yours. Save me. Let's all just say that together. There's power in the words. Jesus, I'm yours. Save me. Jesus, I'm yours. Save me. What a promise, and he will. Okay? Don't let anything keep you from coming to Jesus. Now, he goes on. Verse 9, Peter said, Lord, this is a typical overreaction. Lord, oh, not my feet, but all my, my hands and my head. Wash all of me, Peter says. I just think the disciples are just rolling their eyes. Because <laughs> Peter, <laughs> your big mouth. But Jesus loves him, loves him to the end. He says, says, this, says this to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. 
but not every one of you, for he knew it was to betray him. That's why he said not all of you. What's he talking about? We've been cleaned in Christ. But here's the truth. If you're gonna follow Jesus in a fallen and broken world, you're gonna get dirty. You're gonna get stuff on your feet. You're gonna go to your friend's house and you're gonna track mud all over their carpet. And they're gonna come to your house and track mud all over your carpet. And it's gonna be a big mess. And Jesus is saying, only I can clean the mess. You're clean, but you gotta come back and let me clean you again and 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 again. This is walking with Jesus. It's no accident in Ephesians 6 where Paul's laying out the spiritual armor of God what does he say? And shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given to the gospel of peace. You follow Jesus in a broken world, it's gonna get messy. And so we need to remember, not only we've been cleansed from our sin once for all, but we've gotta keep coming to be served and cleansed by him. And that's not easy. And as we'll see in the moment, he says the most amazing thing and you need to wash one another's feet. This is messiness in community, right? Brokenness, sin, hurt. We gotta wash one another's feet. We gotta give access to each other, to our dirtiness, the dirt on our feet. What we need to see, the profound truth here, is that Jesus will wash your feet through the church. He works through the church the body of Christ. So we do need to come to Jesus and say, cleanse me, wash me again. But we need to come to our brothers and sisters and say, help me. Let me wash your feet. So here's what we've seen. We're gonna labor like Jesus with joy and passion and purpose. We're gonna see in Christ that we have everything. We have everything. And so we can lose. Number two, that we've got to let Jesus wash and serve you. And number three then, We've got to do what Jesus did by the power that Jesus had. We've got to do what Jesus did by the power that Jesus had. Let's look at verses 12 to 17 here. And when he had washed their feet and he put on his outer garment and he resumed this place, his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then I, your Lord, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And the word therefore ought is obligation. It's a strong word. It's not an if. We are obligated to wash one another's feet. If this is what Jesus has done, okay? For I've given you an example that you should also, that you should do, that you should also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So what's he saying? He's identifying with his people. He said, if I'm willing to do this, and I have all power, it's the most powerful man to ever walk the face of the earth. And he gets down and he washes and serves. If you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna become like me, you gotta do what I did because a servant's not greater than his master. I'm an example to you. I'm your substitute, but I'm your example. You're gonna become like me. That's discipleship. You're gonna become like me, so we gotta serve one another. We gotta do what he did. And he says, if we do that, if we understand that, if we comprehend this, you will be blessed. What does that mean to be blessed? Why well, include in there that you will have joy, you will have passion, and you will have purpose. You will be blessed. Three things that we're all after. If we understand and we do these things, we'll be blessed. Finally, say, well, how do I do that? I can't do that. We can't do that on our own. So look what he says here, verses 18 to 20. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. 
talking about Judas betrayal. I am telling you this now, listen, I'm telling you this now before it takes place so that when it does, what? You may believe that I am he. You may trust that I am, I am he. What's he saying? That I am God, that I know what's happening, that I'm in control. It's gonna look bad, it's gonna look terrible, but I'm in control. I'm telling you now, so when it happens, you will know, you will believe, you will trust. Verse 20, truly, truly, amen and amen, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So what is he talking about? Jesus has given us this picture, and we're gonna unpack this in John 14 to 16 in depth. There is an unbroken relationship between God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and you. And some kind of mysterious, mystical way in our union with Christ, we have direct access, direct connection to the inner life of the Trinity. How do we do this? How do we serve like Jesus by the same power that he had? The power of God, the Holy Spirit, walking in repentance, walking by the Spirit, Paul says. It's amazing how much this is in the New Testament. How do we walk, live, be led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus that raised him from the dead? That's where the power to live comes from. It means we have to stay in relationship with him. It means we gotta abide in him, as we'll see in John 15. It's not just a one thing. Jesus died for my sins, and now I'm good. It is a daily walk with Christ, okay? That's the power. You don't have the power. I don't have the power. We are dependent on him to live like Jesus and to become like him. So whatever your calling is, whatever your vocation, wherever you're at right now, however you're laboring, how do we labor like Jesus by the power of Jesus? Let me just tell you what we've said. Number one, in Christ, we already have everything. We gain everything in the end, so we're free to lose now. That is freedom. That is freedom Number two, we've got to let, we've got to let Jesus serve us and wash us. He's not gonna barge into our house and clean our house for us. But he says, I'm here, invite me in. And he will. And number three, we gotta do what Jesus did. We gotta wash one another, we gotta serve one another, we gotta humble ourselves by the power that Jesus had, okay? So here it is, live in relationship with the living Christ right where you are. If you're a school teacher, an engineer, a student, a parent, a barista, if you're in ministry, if you're out of ministry, whatever it is, God is with you and he will be with you and he will walk with you and he will bless you. Maybe not materially, but with joy and passion and purpose. And when the people of God catch a vision and get the passion of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the purposes of Jesus, God can do powerful things. He can change a whole community. He can change the world. He's been doing it for 2,000 years. And so in closing, here's just my three questions for us. Where do you need to be washed by Jesus right now? What dirt does he need to see in your life? You need to invite him in to wash and cleanse and serve you. Number two, where can you serve others this week? Whose feet can you wash? Humbly, serving your spouse, your roommate, your coworker, your boss, your team member, your friend. And number three, where do you need to trust in God's power rather than your own? We need God's power to do this. And by the Holy Spirit, he's given it to us. Amen. All right, would you stand? Let's just pray for us. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you that you've served us. You've given us everything. You've washed our feet and you continue to. And so I ask for each one of us today, and myself included, that we would receive from you, that we would humble ourselves before you and receive your washing and receive your cleansing and to let you serve us, that we might serve others by your power, that we might become more like you more joyful, more passionate, more purposeful, more humble. And so God, I ask you, Holy Spirit, right now, to move in this room, to move in our hearts. Bring us to repentance. Bring us to freedom. That we might love you with all of our hearts, Lord. 
that we might love our neighbor. God, we love you. Pray all this in your name, Jesus, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen.